This is a Peer J video abstract. My name is Srini Heusemann. I'm the director of Unai Scientific Field Station. I initiated and coordinated the study that led to the description of the largest Berlin mass mortality event ever recorded. In April 2015, during an expedition to inventory marine invertebrates in a remote area of the Chilean Patagonia, by coincidence I discovered a couple of dead whales. On a small beach about 100 meters long, we counted eight dead whales. We checked the area by boat, and by the end of the day, we had found almost 30 recently died whales. My colleague Carolina Goodstein and I organized an overflight during which we discovered several hundred more whale carcasses. When we flew over the first 70 dead whales in Seno Escondido, it seemed like a post-apocalyptic scene. We all had the same question in our heads. How many more will we find? What happened? Why here? Was it man-made? What does this mean for the population? And was it the first time? Could it happen again? We knew that this study requires a multidisciplinary approach. And taking into account the magnitude and significance of the discovery, we wanted to gather experienced specialists for the different aspects of the study. Carolina Gutstein and her students did the taphonomic analysis. Andrew Dale and Mike Beddington analyzed the oceanography and made the drift models. David Cassis is a red tide specialist and Carlos Oliveria, the whale expert. Several more authors contributed to the study and we all worked together on interpreting the data. There are two main findings of the study. The first is the discovery of apparently one of the most important feeding areas for sow whales outside the polar region. The second and perhaps most striking finding is the simultaneous death of around 350 sow whales, which marks the largest ever recorded Berlin mass mortality event which can be linked to an intoxication of red tide toxins. Say so whale is one of the 15 so uh, baleen whales. They are cosmopolitan, so you will find them worldwide, all the major oceans. They are filter feeders, so they are going to be eating very small krill, um, you know, so plankton, sometimes fish. So in this area, they very likely that they were feeding on a very small crab. Probably these animals came close to the shore uh, because they were looking for or searching for this kind of food. I am a biologist, so there is one field in this area that's called taphonomy, and this is mainly related to get to know what happens to a body after it's dead and until it gets buried. What we try to do is compare what would happen to a whale if it died in sea or in the shore, or if the live stranded, for example. We looked at the directions they were in the beach and if its positions they were and how articulated or how similar they were in the process of decomposition. We have to know if all the corpses were in the same event or not. In taphonomy or extradynamic analysis, this gave us a clue about it. We find that 90% of the whales, more or less, were there for the same event. This number of skeletal remains of carcasses that were washed in in the same period of time in not so big an area tells us about remediation of sea whales in the coast. Some of the dead whales were found in large numbers inside narrow and shallow inlets with very restricted entrance. Sea whales, however, are described as rather solitary oceanic animals. Wind and currents alone can hardly explain the accumulations in these locations. So why and how did they get in such high numbers into these small embayments? So this event obviously had already happened when it was discovered and there was quite a spread of whale carcasses in, in a variety of different environments over a fairly large region. And so we wanted to be able to backtrack to come to some understanding of where the death of these whales may have occurred. So drift modeling is the prediction of the pathway of objects that are floating at the ocean surface. And so you need to understand the influence of, of waves, of, of wind directly acting on, on those objects and also on the, the underlying oceanic currents that are, are going to transport them. We used existing model products, so, so large-scale ocean models and, and wind models, in order to predict some of the broad-scale pattern of the distribution of the, these whale carcasses. The important conclusion here is that the whales must have, have died within the, the inlets, essentially. There's no mechanism that could have brought them into the inlets from, from external coastal waters. Whales that died within the fjords could have been exported with the surface freshwater flow and then distributed more widely by the currents that they encountered when they were in the surrounding coastal waters. So we know that this event 
was definitely spread over at least 200 kilometers with multiple sites. It, it wasn't a, a small localized event, it was region wide, and it certainly had a number of focuses which were within fjords, but we don't know whether deaths were happening more widely in coastal waters or whether a number of death events within fjords were seeding the coastal waters surrounding them. I did detect the toxin in the shellfish, which is a normal vector that keeps this, uh, this toxin for long periods of time. Also, I detected the toxin in the stomach contents of the whales, but I did not detect it in the water. We went to the area several months after the mortality happened, so the phytoplankton had already changed. So normally we have three factors. Or closer to the land, we have or a low probability of a harmful algal blooms. Then we have a high amount of food around the coast and off the coast. And also we have the whales that don't have to go so close to the coast to feed. The three factors are relatively separate. During El Nino, we have lower strength and amounts of, of wind. So that means that there's a lower amount of nutrients that come up to feed the phytoplankton. That creates a lower amount of food. So the zooplankton and small fish have to move closer inland. Also, there's a higher probability of harmful algal blooms happening closer to the land. So we have an overlap of these two factors. Then we have the whales coming up the coast and needing to feed into this environment where the three factors combine. We think that that happens during El Nino years, and we think that it explains the, the large mortality that we saw. The implications of our findings are alarming. Red tide events can be triggered by El Nino, and El Nino events become more frequent and stronger due to global warming. So we have to assume that mortalities from red tide would become more frequent and larger. This means that marine mammals might be among the first oceanic megafauna victims of climate change.